You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. Roll initiative, Will. (laughs) And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode two of Spooky 2022. Spooky! That's a lot of twos. A lot of twos. This year we are doing Monsters of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh boy, oh boy. And this episode we are visiting the Displacer Beast. Yeah, another classic and weird creature. Oh, it's it's so cool but so bizarre. Once again, this series, Spooky, Spookulative Evolution, is a series where we take classic and popular monsters and creatures of myth, movie, and stories and figure out using our real world evolutionary rules of natural selection how could a creature that resembles and behaves like that monster come to exist a bit of speculative evolution themed for the holiday indeed and once again for this year we are investigating the monsters of dungeons and dragons D, which for anyone who's never played it before is the tabletop role-playing game where you make a character roll some dice to see how good they do at different things, and typically fight monsters. Yes, wizards and fighters and rangers and rogues going into the dark places of the world, investigating mystery, finding treasure, fighting bad guys, and encountering monsters. That last part is where we come in. Indeed. The monster for today is the Displacer Beast. So after a brief intro to our monster, we will then try and figure out how something like it could evolve. This is just for fun. This isn't meant to be anything definitive. Uh, I feel like that's probably more important to say this year since we're dealing with nerdy stuff. Yeah. Well, (laughs) and stuff that people have already had conversations like this about. Yes. Undoubtedly. This is just our take on how a creature like this monster could evolve. And we invite you to also think about this. Yes. And come up with your own ideas and even share them with us. For this episode, we will be taking a look at the Displacer Beast. The Displacer Beast is a weird creature, a slightly more alien creature than our last one, the Owlbear, and is, at first glimpse, pretty normal looking. It looks like a big cat, like a panther of some sort, black in color, except it's got two extra legs Mm -hmm. and two long squid-like tentacles extruding from its back. Yes. And a special magical ability. Yes, thus its name. So, David, what is, in the game of D&D, a Displacer Beast? Well, I'll tell you. Once again, like with last episode, the information I'm presenting has come from the 5th edition Monster Manual specifically. So this is current, modern-day game info about Displacer Beasts. Yeah, David's the one who usually runs our D&D game, so... He's the one that'd be wielding these monsters against us. Yes, although I've never thrown a Displacer Beast at my players before. The Monster Manual describes a Displacer Beast as resembling a sleek, great cat covered in blue-black fur. As you mentioned, it has six legs. They look like cat legs, like a big panther or tiger, but there is an extra pair in the middle. Typically of the four legs. So it's got four front legs and then two normal back legs. Sure, sure. And it has two long tentacles sprouting out of its shoulders. And the tentacles are long and very flexible, like tentacles tend to be on weird, bizarre, made-up creatures. (laughs) And they end in broad pads with a bunch of spikes on them. A bunch of spiky protrusions, like some sort of monstrous squid. A displacer beast is also big. It is classified in the large category, which is the category that includes tigers, but also horses and bears like grizzly bears so this is at least a tiger sized cat while we're on the note of physical attributes the monster manual also describes that its eyes glow with an awful malevolence that persists even in death yeah literally glow (laughs) yeah because we're in we're monsters now and then finally a displacer beast has a special ability that is referred to as displacement This is what makes Displacer Beasts stand out. This is their weird magical thing. They have the magical ability to, as the book describes it, displace light to appear several feet away from where they actually are. Yes. So when you're looking at a Displacer Beast, that's not where it is. It's actually a little bit off from that. They have this magical ability to look like they are somewhere slightly different. Yeah. 
in terms of some game mechanics, the way that Displacer Beasts function within the rules of D&D. Uh, they are, like the owl bear last episode, very strong, high constitution, but they're strong and tough, they're durable, they are monsters. They are monstrosities. Like we said last time, it, uh, in D&D, most animals, like tigers, crocodiles, things like that, are classified as beasts. Monstrosities tend to be things that are a little more monstrous and weird. Yeah, a little more unnatural. Like the owl bear, like the displacer beast. Displacer beasts are on a similar challenge level, at what do they call challenge rating, as an owl bear. These are deadly opponents for low-level characters. Yes. Displacer beasts are also characterized as lawful evil. Yeah. In terms of alignment, <laughs> uh, which we'll get to. I, I'll bring that up again here in a little, in just a bit. In combat, the Displacer Beast's main offensive ability is to make a multi-attack. That's two swipes, one with each tentacle. They have reach, so they can reach ten feet away from it, so it can attack from a distance. And they deal both bludgeoning and piercing damage. <laughs> so they hit hard, but also the spikes get you. It's a slap and a stab. Yes. And then there is that displacement ability that they have. In game mechanics terms, the displacement ability is basically means that they are harder to hit. So if you're trying to attack them, either they get a bonus to avoiding the attack or you get a detriment to that attack roll. Yes. They're hard to hit with a weapon or with a spell or something. Although notably, uh, that, that ability gets disrupted if they take damage. Yeah. Or if they are incapacitated or rooted to the spot. So it can be interrupted. Uh, and maybe that's just that they you know, breaks their focus on it or who knows, but it can be turned off temporarily. As far as behavior goes, there's a bunch of cool behavioral information in here. Displacer beasts are predators, unsurprisingly. They are big cats. The book specifies that they kill for food, but also for sport. Yeah. They just like hunting. They hunt and kill using their tentacles. The book specifies that they hunt alone or in small prides and that they set ambushes. And the, the type of ambush described in the book is a single beast will strike and withdraw, luring prey into a densely wooded area where its packmates wait. Mm -hmm. Which seems like a great way to hunt in the world of D&D &D when everything wants to attack everything else. Yes, where, where your prey is a bunch of players looking for XP. Yes, <laughs> or an owl bear that will attack anything that moves. <laughs> uh, it also notes that packs that hunt near trade roads can recall the frequency and schedule of caravans. Cool. So they'll remember what, how often caravans come by. And this brings up an interesting point about the way that they're described. They are described as being somewhat intelligent, that they, they have some degree of understanding, although in terms of their game stats, they don't have an, a high intelligence statistic. They don't learn language. They don't have those features of like sentient beings but they are described as, as being relatively smart creatures. Yeah, so, somewhat crafty. Uh, this also comes up in this next point. Like we mentioned with the owl bear, displacer beasts are sometimes tamed. Mm -hmm. The book notes that they are sometimes kept as pets to guard something or as bodyguards. Yeah. That some impressive person will keep a displacer beast with them as protection. But the book says... A displacer beast enters such an alliance only if it appears beneficial. Yeah. So again, there's this, they're, they're cunning, they're yeah. crafty. Uh, this is where that lawful evil alignment comes in. They act, they do seem to have intent. Yeah. As opposed to a lot of D&D &D monsters that are just there. Just hungry. Just hungry. And finally, in the monster manual, there's some notes about the origins, the in-world origins of displacer beasts. The book notes that they roamed the Feywild for ages. So the Feywild is the alternate reality, basically. Magical mirror of the world where elves and things like that live. And then the Displacer Beasts were, as the story goes, captured by warriors, evil warriors, and selectively bred to reinforce their ferocious predatory nature. And then, like so many captive things, they escaped. Yep, they went feral. They went feral. So the displacer beasts, supposedly the displacer beasts that you are likely to encounter in your game of D&D &D are feral displacer beasts after having been bred to be extra ferocious and predatory. Yeah. 
which is a, a rare instance in the D&D world of a fairly explained origin. Yeah, the, a, there's a canonical reason why they're so monstrous. Yep. As for real world origins, this is another original monster. All the way back to the beginning. To D&D, going back to the beginning. You know, because there's other monsters in D&D like dragons and griffins, which were not created for D&D, just added to right, it. Borrowed by D&D. This one was created for it, though it was inspired by an already existing monster. The inspiration for the Displacer Beast was something called the Coerol or the Curl from a book in 1939 sci-fi story called Black Destroyer by A.E. Van Vogt, which also showed up in a later 1950 novel, The Voyage of the Space Beagle. Hmm. The Voyage of the Space Beagle? Right? Isn't That's that awesome? <laughs> right? <laughs> This was a feline-like creature, wise and terrifyingly evil, it was described. Oh. With black fur, black as night, they said, with barbed tentacles okay. on it. Okay. It wasn't described having multiple limbs as far as I could find, mm -hmm. but it was a black evil cat with tentacles. In the story, it, like, plays innocent, like, cute kitten and gets onto the ship before attacking. Okay. Or, or trying to take out some of the crewmates if i'm right and yeah. then they i think they launch it out into space sure alien queen style <laughs> so that inspired the creation of the displacer beast which has been included since greyhawk 1975 the first edition of D, &D mm -hmm. and therefore on it's been included in every other edition since this is another one of those iconic classic synonymous with D, &D kind of monsters which is why we included it in spooky yep also, as far as just some extra info, like last time, I pulled a bunch of this from the Forgotten Realms wiki, which goes through a bunch of D&D info through multiple editions. Uh, there are also evidently other names for the Displacer Cat, Displacer Beast in World, the Durlagrun, or the, the Omlar Cat. Hmm. It was also described that they have been believed to potentially live hundreds of years. Okay. Like, very long-lived, potentially. Able to see in the dark and stuff like that. Sure. It did, though, give a description for how the light-bending illusion is supposed to work anatomically. Oh. That they have a series of specialized nerves in their outer layer of skin that are able to create vibrations, very, very slight but very powerful vibrations that they described as molecular vibrations. That they're able to vibrate their molecules on the outer layer of skin, and that's what bends the light. Hmm. So that there is something to their skin, to their actual yeah, anatomy. Yeah, it's a physical trait in that description. Yes. They just said it they said it fills the same role as many illusion spells, but it is not in this interpretation technically a spell. Interesting. Which is interesting because the monster manual explicitly calls it a magical ability. Yes, other things called it magical, but yeah, in yeah. some other versions they have described the anatomy. There could still be magic in these special nerves. Mm-hmm. Interesting. They also specified that, in at least in this version, Displacer Beasts could see each other's true location. Oh, that's cool. That they were not duped by the illusion. Yeah, yeah. These also, like the owlbear, described as having hidden layers. They are specified to be highly territorial, mm -hmm. uh, and either the pride having its own territory and attacking anything that threatens it. Though it, was, it said that mating pairs will go find their own place when they give birth. And raise their young, so evidently they're good parents. Cool. Well, and indeed, last time I mentioned uh, that I looked up variations, like variants of the monster. I did look up variants of the Displacer Beast, and the only one that I found worth noting was Displacer Beast Kitten. Yeah! Which I think is part of an adventure where you find kittens that I, I, I suspect you then encounter the parent. Yes. Yep. So, yeah, apparently they, they have a, a history of being good parents. Yep, yep. And there's a description of what they're like when they're first born. It said, they are born, as they put it, with eyes open and mouths full of functional sharp teeth. <laughs> so they're good to go from day one, basically. Yeah, yeah. They don't yet They are have, precocial. Yes. They don't have hunting skills yet, so they have to learn those from the parent. Yeah. How to hunt and what to hunt and where to hunt, but they are born ready to go, but they lack tentacles, oh. is what this said. Now, I'm sure that has varied in how people might have portrayed. Yeah, the stats on the Displacer Beast kitten that I found, which is from one of the supplemental, I think, adventure books yes. uh, for 5th edition, they 
do have fewer abilities. Like, they don't attack twice every turn. They have a weakened displacement ability, but they do have a tentacle attack. Yeah. So they, they as kittens, they still have tentacles in that version. Which then could indicate their age, because <laughs> they said they are <laughs> born without tentacles, just small little knobbly growths on the back. But then they start sprouting around eight weeks into their life and oh. grow swiftly an inch per day. Wow. <laughs> All right. So yeah, these might, that still tracks. Yeah. And it said they didn't leave their family until their tentacles and their hunting and I- illusion displacement ability were fully developed. All right. So you could have partially tentacled, like not full length. Yeah. Yeah. Kitten displacers. I don't remember. I don't. In the stats that I found for the Displacer Beast Kitten, their reach with their tentacle attack is five feet, <laughs> which is not the extended reach of the adult. So yeah. it, they do seem to be smaller tentacles. Yes. Or at least a smaller body. Yes. It may be proportional, but tinier <laughs> animal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then I did find a couple of variants. Like what, there was a picture from one of the things of a white furred, like Arctic Displacer okay. Beast. Sure. Uh, and then I found a couple of different things that listed big displacer beasts like one that was just giant ones called a mutant that was like twice the size but also evidently there's been one called a pack lord which was the leader of a pack that was a bit bigger a bit smarter and i think even described as being like human intelligence like could potentially understand language like what you can negotiate with it yeah if not maybe speak there was a couple of things that described like there have been ex- examples of displacers throughout the history of D&D that have spoke before. Yes, which is true of a lot of D&D monsters. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, we've got our big weird tentacle hexapod cat. Yeah. With illusion abilities. Now, that's a great time to segue into our next little section before we actually start discussing speculative evolution, which is our magic disclaimer. Yep. Many monsters have abilities that are just impossible. They are supernatural. No way to get creative. There's no clever way to... It just isn't possible. And when we come across those abilities, we kind of just have to bite the bullet and skip over them because we're not going to be able to evolve like actual magic or actual sci-fi abilities. Spells and things like that. Just don't. They're outside the scope of evolution by natural selection. Yes. The displacement is definitely on the edge of this rule. And I think we we might be able to come up with something at least close. Yes. It won't be bending light. No. <laughs> because... And it won't be a magical ability. No. Because actually bending... You need to have something the light passes through to bend the light. Right. So you could still... They could still be distorting light, but they're not going to be controlling light to the point where they can just choose what someone else sees yes that's not that's not quite possible so we'll see how much of this we can uh, mm-hmm. develop the first question i have much like when we started the elevator the first big question that i kept thinking of the entire time with this is is this a six-limbed animal or an eight-limbed yes animal? <laughs> i had the same well and this so when we start our speculative evolution We are interested in the question of not only why does it have the features it does in terms of function, right? Every organism's features are a function of what they're used for and their ancestors. Yes. How are they surviving? But also, what did they evolve from? Yes. Is the displacer beast a mammal? Yeah. Is it a cat? And I can't really think of a good way to get a mammal... With yeah, this many extra limbs. There are eight limbs on this thing. Like, maybe we could get creative with the tentacles and, like, that they are something else. That they're not actually bony limbs because they're ten- So they don't have bones in them. Sure, sure. Perceivably. They could be something else. Well, and I was thinking maybe even the middle pair of legs could be some sort of false protrusion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is a possibility. I don't know what that's for. The other option uh, is instead of taking an animal that ancestrally has four limbs, like mammals, and giving it extra ones, is to start with ancestors that have six or eight limbs. Yep. In which case, we're talking about invertebrates. Yes. And we are either thinking of something like an insect yep. that has six limbs, and insects have been known to develop extra appendages. Which is where my brain initially went on... Do we count the tentacles as limbs or are they 
specialized wings or antennae or something weird right. like that. Or we go with something that already has eight limbs. Yes. Uh, in which case we could be talking about arachnids. Yeah. Or, and it feels almost too good, uh, cephalopods. Yes. Octopuses, which of course have t- arms and potentially tentacles. Oh, but arachnids, that just gave me the idea of harvestmen and and whip scorpions. Harvestmen are cousins of scorpions. Uh, they, instead of having claws, they typically have like spiky clubs that face in toward the mouth to like... Mm-hmm roughly grab and shove toward face their sure. prey and they will sometimes have tails quote unquote like a scorpion does i was they're... about to say it also has a tail yes which we have to keep in mind yep it has a cat a long <laughs> and it has like a long cat tail yeah, like a cat tail a sinuous but like twice the length of any cat you like mm-hmm. the pictures of displacer bees typically give them <laughs> very kind of almost lizard length tails yeah where it's like the length of their body again but harvest men have the eight, the ten legs that mm-hmm. arachnids actually have, but eight, you know, on the sides and then the two up front that have become those specialized arms. And sometimes they'll have a tail, but it will just be like a whip. But many of them will have a specialized pair of legs. I think it's like the second pair. Maybe it's the first pair on some. So they've got six walking legs and then a specialized pair that have been turned into long, flexible feeler legs because mm. this because this group of, uh, of arthropods don't have antennae. So they have these long antennae legs, very tentacly, mm-hmm. and then six walking legs. All right. All right. And now antennae also is a good option, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. for insects, uh, a Something like an arachnid is also a bit appealing because they can also have hair-like yep. body covering. Yeah, you can have a black, hairy uh, arachnid. So, I, yeah, no. I like that a lot. Like, cephalopods also would would give us the clubbed tentacles and all that stuff. Yep. Cephalopods also are very good at camouflage. Yes, which, which is a really great... is a great starting point for something like the displacement. Yeah. Uh, now, they are meant to be tiger-sized. Yeah. Which is hard for any of the options that we've just been discussing that's the biggest the biggest issue with invertebrates that's that's a very big for an invert one thought that does come to mind and this is this is maybe a bit of a cop out but in our plants episode we would often return to the concept of hallucinogenics on like this is true that's super common in plants <laughs> so how does a plant be monstery well the person seeing it is high right <laughs> and hallucinating <laughs> i i just had the thought of like what if the displacement is also some sort of altered reality, you know, altered perception mm-hmm. that is being induced, you know, whether it's hallucinogenics or or some other form of poisoning. That's and, true. And then that also causes the, the, the this is where the cop out comes in, that that also <laughs> could be explained for like, and it had six limbs right. and, and, and tentacles, tentacles coming out around. of its back and my mother's <laughs> face, like, like, yeah, glowing eyes. Yes, exactly. Which it, it feels a little bit like a cop out. That's that's not well, as much fun. My my first thought for the displacement was actually going to be inspired by cephalopods, where you have octopus and cuttlefish and things that can blend in with their environment, but can also adjust to the pattern. Yes, that appears on their body, and that maybe this is an animal with a similar ability. That has evolved to project a pattern that makes it look like it is not quite where it is. Yeah. No, I definitely like the idea of skin, like chromatophores and and, and color cells. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's also a couple of cephalopods with special reflecting cells that have, instead of pigment, reflective surfaces to help them kind of disappear in open water. Yeah. Where they just look like a shimmer of light in the water. So you could also have something like that to where I can't quite think of a great way to sh- make it seem like I'm two feet off from where I am. Right. Because that's also one of those where it's like, even if we do go with that, you have some light bending ability. That's that's not what it would probably look like. like no, but if, it could it could still be slightly breaking up the, the outline of the yes, body. And that's what I've been thinking is that I'm just obscuring where I am. It might not work out in an open field as easily. Mm-hmm. But in a forest and among trees that yeah. I can just blur my extent a little bit so that you can't tell my leg is here. Yes. Now, other animals that have 
similar ability to adjust the color patterns on their bodies. There are a number of reptiles that do it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how common it is in amphibians. I don't either. But I can certainly imagine something like a salamander. I know there are salamanders that will change color over the course of their development. Yeah. And while I'm mentioning salamanders, it is not uncommon for amphibians to develop extra limbs. True. Developmentally. And some salamanders have fins or frills or external gills that could certainly form the foundation for something like extra appendages. Very true. So yeah, there's definitely definitely things to work with there. That also, if we are going with a chromatophore thing, I don't think we see anything like that in any arthropods. Not that I can think of. Because their outer layer of skin is is basically non-living now it's like, chitin it's chitin it, it's exoskeleton it is not living tissue you know if you crack it it does the shell doesn't bleed mm-hmm. they can heal that the next time they shed their skin yes that that is like your fingernail kind of at that point so you can't be mimic you can't be controlling the colors and mm-hmm. shapes of it because it's static so you can't have color changing with a, an arthropod that way there's also the much simpler option of just a pattern of color on the body that breaks up the color outline, yes. which we see in a lot of animals. A lot of lizards and snakes, for example, will do that. And you definitely have things where you can have a dynamic pattern like that that shifts. Uh, like a lot of insects do that with their wings, where it's like mm-hmm. if I close my wings, I have this camouflage. If I open them, I have this display. Yes. So if I had like specialized wings or something that instead of were for flight, were for covering portions of my body that I could shift and unfold to increase my number of spots and then fold up to make myself all black and then flip them over to give scary display or the display like I have too long, you know, tentacles or something like that. Yeah. So you could get dynamic with something like that. And like we've made big inver- invertebrates before. Yeah. Well, it's it sounds like whatever we want to do, all of our choice animals for ancestors are small things that need to be big. Yep. So we could be we could go with salamanders mm-hmm. and maybe the tentacles or some weird gill development. Or we can go with cephalopods and you have walking legs somehow. Or we can go with some sort of weird big arthropod and there's some weird antennae or feelers. And I do I do like the arthropod angle. That's the one I'm leaning toward. Because then you can total there are there are tons of arthropods. So I'm thinking of ants and yep. beetles. There are tons of arthropods whose bodies are shaped bizarrely. Yes. Oftentimes so that they look like something else. Yes. There are tons of ants whose body segments are weirdly misshapen. So they look like wasps or spiders. There are tons of bugs that have misshapen body segments because they've evolved to blend in with leaves or sticks. So you could easily imagine an arthropod-like animal whose body looks a lot like a big cat-like creature. Absolutely. Uh, well, and I just had the idea for the tentacles. Like, those could be antennae. Uh, if we went with a more than six-legged thing, it could be one of the pairs of legs. And I do like the antennae. Right? Appro- that is a very cool approach. Another thought I had for how do we get dramatic projections is stag beetles. Uh, oh, yeah. Which have either mandibles, but a lot of the like Hercules and rhinoceros beetles and other stag beetle cousins will have these long horns coming off of their back. The carapace on their back just has grown into these extreme projections many of which are hooked or barbed at the end yeah they are so you could have these really dramatic swooping black tentacular but static things and if you're still using them you know moving your body to swipe with those you know shifting around and attacking with those it could give the impression of swiping attacking appendages absolutely Especially if we have an organism that is somehow distorting its overall shape. Yes. Well, and if they are uh, something similar to antennae for exploring the environment, then it would also be the thing it uses first to reach out and investigate something nearby. Yep. Yep. And also the horns and stuff like that that we see on things like stag beetles are commonly used in combat. Yep. For wrestling and fighting each other. So that might be something that it does 
behaviorally. Yeah. You know, even if it's defensively. Yeah, I, I, I do like the idea of we've got an arthropod, it's got several limbs, and then an extra pair of feelers or antennae, yeah. and then a, a, a circus in the back, which is the segment that functions like a tail. Yes. Which we see in a bunch of things. And if we go arachnid or something like that, then we get cite yep. all over the body. We can make it furry. And it's furry. And I, I do kind of like the furry approach because it's a big... You know, cats are muscly and, and beefy animals, which brings to mind something like a tarantula. Yep. Yep. They do have those retracting claws, which is gives you another cat-like association. Uh, now we're kind of mixing our arachnid sure, sure. ancestry. Well, and we can start at the base of the arachnid yes. family tree and so then develop. lots of converging evolutions. So I, I think we've got... The idea of an arthropod. I love your suggestion about manipulable body segments mm -hmm. that can make the shape and size of it seem different than it is. If this is the angle we're going with, we need to come up with an answer to the question of how do we get an arthropod to be tiger-sized? Yes, and I think that this thought I just had puts the nail on the coffin for me that this is absolutely the way we should go, that... If anyone's ever been camping someplace or just been out in like a field at night and you shine your flashlight across the grass oh. and you get a lot of pinpricks of light that look like glistening dew, they're usually not dew. What you're seeing is the reflective lenses of wolf spiders, yeah, which have reflective material, mineral uh, molecules in the eye like a cat does mm -hmm. to give them better night vision. Which would give us a great set of glowing displacer beast eyes. Well, and also, and again, we're mixing our arachnids here, but there are scorpions that glow yeah. in fluorescence, which does mean that they are reflecting and refracting light mm -hmm. in weird ways. Yes. All right. So why is it so big? Arachnid. I like this direction. Uh, so if we go back to the Carboniferous. Mm-hmm. There were giant arachnids uh, and other arthropods in part because it was an ecosystem without large predators to keep them down. Yes. And also in part probably because of very high oxygen levels that allowed them to fuel their giant bodies. We also have uh, eurypterids. Which are sea scorpions, which started in the oceans and grew to extremely large sizes. And eurypterids also have long tails. Yep. And they have those claw-like appendages yep. up front, so they have the modified appendages. Is our displacer beast a Eurypterid? I think I, yeah, I think so, because that also gets well, us it, the size. And it gets us the size and bigger, stronger limbs yep. for walking around. Absolutely. So if we got a terrestrial Eurypterid, uh, yeah, no. What a weird direction for this to go, but I love it. Yeah, well, because then if you have those, cl those claw-like arms but they get shifted up to the back. Yeah, for exploring a more vertical environment. Yeah, but also for attacking. So they mm -hmm. could be longer and, and more dexterous, but still have those club-like claws that they were so well known for. And if they're moving from the aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment, they could do something like we've seen done with, for example, crocodilians, mm -hmm. which in the aquatic environment are very sprawly and on their bellies, but then high walk. Yes. They stand up more erect when they go out onto a terrestrial environment. Is this some sort of Eurypterid sea scorpion branch that evolved terrestriality? Yeah. So the scenario that I'm picturing now is so Eurypterids were very common in Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, in the early part of the Paleozoic. By the time we get to the Carboniferous, the Devonian Carboniferous, where we see land ecosystems really taking off, Eurypterids were much less common yes. at that point. I don't remember when Eurypterids go extinct off the top of my head, but they were not available to become a major part of those terrestrial ecosystems. But in our speculative evolution lineage, maybe they were. Yes. And there was a branch of Eurypterids that around the same time that fish moved onto land yep. and became tetrapods, we could have a branch of Eurypterids that did the same thing and joined those early predators. Yeah. And then if they inhabited those forests, a sleeker, more compartmentalized body design 
where your tail becomes a smaller aspect of the body instead of that big yeah. long round tail now it can be used more for balance mm -hmm. as you move around in a a realm where gravity has sway yes we could imagine uh the front body segments becoming somewhat more reduced and head-like mm -hmm. with s somewhat smaller mandibles because you're feeding on smaller things yep and then yeah those claw appendages becoming more of an exploratory yep. pair of appendages especially if you're in the trees and stuff and you need to reach up above you yes yeah to grab stuff i like all that that's so weird i like it a lot it's so weird and i love it yep that's how we have eight appendages. Well, and I like that because one of the issues with trying to find, and I was trying to think of like one of the issues with all other arthropods is that they've all got sprawling limbs. Mm -hmm. And while these still did, they were, to my knowledge, very much swimming. A lot of them were, yeah. Like a fresh land, water to land transition would give us the chance for a much more under the body centralized limb situation yes like i said we've seen that in crocs mm -hmm. we've seen that in tetrapods yep the fish gave rise to tetrapods that are more using strong limbs to get up on land so yeah i like that a lot now and if they are in an ecosystem where they predate a lot of big amphibians or big reptiles they can occupy that niche where yes. they become some of the early big predators yep so alongside the labyrinthodonts and the big amphibians and stuff are these arthropods that have adapted these larger terrestrial habits absolutely i uh, think that's great it's awesome and you know there'd be have to be some internal things like they'd need more efficient breathing sure. to stay that big for a long time you know throughout differing ages or to get bigger, potentially. Mm -hmm. you know, so you'd have to have some innovations we haven't seen in other arthropods. Yes. That would have to happen in this group. They'd, they'd be... have to be structurally more, more sturdy. Yep. Uh, adaptations to the exoskeleton, for sure. But we can hand wave all that. That's nice and easy to do. Yep, that's stuff Just that... wave my hand right now. Could happen. I saw, it do, I saw you do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now we just have to figure out how to displace it. So I like the idea of adjustable body segments Yeah, that you could have uh, arthropods will often end up with the various segments of the body that adapt into gills or paddles or wings or wing covers that can adjust to alter the shape or appearance of what the animal is. Yes. So we get some folding or flexible or or some section of the exoskeleton that's on joints that they could move mm -hmm. or we give them chromatophores yeah and we say that they've developed uh color changing abilities like we see in some other animals well especially if they have like sections or something like if there's weird mixture of strong supporting rigid exoskeleton but then transparent sections Oh, yeah. You could have like windows to the living soft tissue underneath the exoskeleton mm -hmm. that then could do color changing and could do, you know, displacement of, of their pattern and even reflection and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Another option that is somewhat similar to that is we talked about covering them in setae, which yep. is the arthropod version of hair. Maybe they're covered in setae that appear as a different color depending on the angle mm -hmm. that it's at so they could raise their hairs up or move them to adjust the color that it gives off yeah no I, and i i like that's kind of what i was trying to think of with the the like appendages but the, the hair would be really good for that that they can shimmer their image by moving the hairs yeah and if they're moving around hunting at night in the darkness in a forest where there's already mottled light you could easily see a person observing it moving while it's shimmering and the moonlight through the leaves is moving around and there's all sorts of different shadows of branches and bushes and stuff losing track of where the actual creature is. Absolutely. And trying to shoot an arrow at it and just hitting a tree. Another thought, and this this might be pushing it for our <laughs> arthropod, but depending on, you know, they're, they're social arthropods, 
they were said to hunt in packs. Uh, yeah, and I had that thought way early yeah. on. Maybe our person who documented this just saw two of them. Yeah, and, <laughs> and or you know saw one, then almost got attacked by another that came from definitely came a different from, spot from the sides. And then they looked, the other one wasn't there, so there had to have only been one. Yep. They use a pack hunting tactic that is mm-hmm. one standing obvious and one staying hidden attack sort of thing. Yes. We also discussed that they are good parents. Yes. Uh, and I had the great image of them carrying their babies around on their backs. Oh, yeah. Like we see spiders and, and similar animals do today. Absolutely. and and Which would also uh, alter their the, the outline of their body. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. Yes, it would. And that's a nice thing with arthropods who have been shown to be good parents mm-hmm. and are born ready to eat and hunt. Yes, which is another nice thing about the arthropod setup is that they're born ready to go. Yes. Uh, arthropods are not typically learning or developing very much compared to things like mammals. Mm-hmm. That doesn't leave as much room for you know crafty, conniving behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, but complex enough instincts can often seem that way. Absolutely. Like, well, and certain things like learning the patterns of caravans and stuff like that, that's not particularly uncommon in animals no. to learn. You know, in captivity, we see animals learn the schedule of feeding. Yes. So that's definitely reasonable. Yeah. I like that. I knew that D&D Monsters was going to get weird. Oh, yeah. I didn't expect it to get weird this soon. Yeah. I <laughs> While taking notes for Displacer, I, I kept having moments of like, I have... I kept having the thought that, like, usually I'm able to come up with one or two things just passively mm-hmm. while take, getting the notes ready. Uh, this time I struggled. Yeah. Well, it's the eight. It's all those appendages. That really throws it off. Yeah. Extra limbs is not something that is easy to evolve. So we have developed a terrestrial Eurypterid, a sea scorpion. That has retained its long back of its abdomen as a tail-like structure. Yeah. That has retained six of its limbs as... Walking appendages. For getting around. That has adapted its front clawed appendages as more elevated exploratory appendages. Mm -hmm. Possibly for display, possibly for combat, possibly just for reaching up and grabbing stuff out of trees. Mm Mm-hmm. And perhaps has a main pair of eyes. Yes. That glow like wolf spiders. Yep, yep. And then the body is covered in adjustable segments, possibly just hairs. Yep, hairs. Maybe maybe transparent color changing sections, something. Mm-hmm. That gives it this shimmery appearance that breaks up its outline and makes it difficult to identify exactly where it is. In the nighttime forest where it hunts. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave the decision of which of those displacement adaptations it has to any artists that that want to draw it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Whichever well, one you think will look coolest in your fan art. And then the best part of this is what we can say is we have created a natural starting point that then the evil warriors can selectively yes. breed to be even more displacer beast like. Yeah, that at some point these get domesticated. By... Or at least captured. Yeah. So there's at least some amount of taming and domestication going on of mm-hmm. making them work to the the tasks they want them to. All right. Not where I expected it to go, but I like it a lot. All right. Very cool. The yes, there it is. Our displacer beast. <laughs> is a terrestrial Eurypterid from the Devonian Carboniferous Forests. Yes. Well, and the thing I kind (laughs) of really like about that is, in canon, the Displacer's Beast is an alien creature. It is from the Feywild. From another realm. Another realm. It is not from this plane. It is from a different reality. So it is innately alien to the life you know, the natural life in in the normal D&D setting. So I like that this has a little bit of that, where it's like, no, this is from yeah. the sea. It is a... And, sh- and, and from the Paleozoic. And from the past. Like, it, it would be it and its descendants, you know, whatever subspecies it splits off into and other species it might speciate to create mm-hmm. would be the only remaining Eurypterids 
Yes. Around today. Yeah, we lost the aquatic ones. Yes. There's, there's just these terrestrial offshoots. And and that it is an extremely weird version of that group. And therefore, also, since it's the only remaining me- member, like, sloths today, that just seem to not fit in with anyone else. Mm-hmm. Because you're all that's left of a yeah. old, weird group. Ooh, yeah. So this was a super weird one. Yes. As always, dear listeners... Uh, We encourage you to join in the fun. If you have cool ideas, alternate suggestions, other ideas, feel free to let us know. If you have one that's a little more friendly to Occam's Razor. (laughs) Sure. Listen, I think we've done a great job. I love this, but I'm just waiting for a listener to be like, why didn't you use this animal? Well, it's like that. And for us to go, oh, yeah, that would have worked. It's like that episode where we forgot what Kalugos were. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I'm waiting for someone to just be like. You could have just used blank. Yeah, here's the displacer beast. Which is already, basically. <laughs> which, great. <laughs> hop on the social media, hop on our Discord, find the links for those things in the episode description, and you can share your ideas with us. Absolutely. Also, if we happen to have inspired anybody to create fan art, not asking for it, just saying, if you do, tag us, let us know, share it with us. We love to see those. We welcome it so much. We will happily post it. Share it on our social medias and post it on our blog if you so wish. So send that our way. With that, we are two episodes down, two to go this year. Two more Saturdays, two more monsters. We now have our Monotreme Owlbear and our Eurypterid Displacer Beast. I just that phrase is fantastic. Isn't I it? love the I love the words Eurypterid Displacer Beast. Is two groups we have never used before, Monotremes and Eurypterids? Yeah. We've gotten two new groups of organisms. Ah, uh, it's fantastic. And man, we thought these were going to be the normal ones. Oh yeah, we thought these would be the easiest. Just you wait to see what we have coming up in the next couple episodes. Who it gets weird. <laughs> we record these in order, so we as of this recording, we don't know what we came up with. Yep. For the next episodes. <laughs> nope. So we can't wait to see what we come up with. <laughs> Till then. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.